page resource. But for doing that, I'll need help of a class which I will import. So let me import it from this library. From the Azure folder, there is a subfolder called Cognitive Services. Inside that subfolder, there is another subfolder called Speech. That subfolder I will reference as SDK. Now inside that subfolder called Speech that I have referenced as SDK, um, from that subfolder, there is a file called Translation. And from that file, I will try to call this class called speech translation config. And this is the class that will help me to perform that authentication. In order to perform authentication, as I mentioned, two things will be required. One is key of the resource, and second is the region in which the resource lies. Okay, so using, the, using these two things, authentication will be performed. If authentication is successful, then access to resource will be granted. And if access is granted, then I just want to print a confirmation message to the user that access has been granted. Okay, access has been granted. Okay, let's see. I just I'll just run the coding file. Let's see whether access to resource has been granted or not. And you can see access has been granted. So that's good news. Now let's proceed ahead. Okay, now I will try to work with my speech resource. And using my speech resource, I will try to convert my speech from one language to another. Let's see how to do that. Okay, so uh, behind the scenes, what will happen is four steps will be performed. First, it will take your speech, which could be in any language. Let's suppose my speech will be in English language. Okay, from English language, that speech will be converted to text of English language. Then, that text of English language will be converted to uh, speech. Uh, sorry, that text of English language will be converted to text of your target languages. So let's suppose from English, I want to convert it to Hindi. Uh, then from English, I want to convert it to French. From English, I want to convert it to Spanish. From English, I want to convert it to Kannada language and so on. Then that text of your target languages will be converted to speech. Okay. OK. Fine. So internally, these four steps will be performed. All right, so first uh, my input speech will be given to the resource. So I'll just communicate to the resource uh, that what will be the uh, language of the speech that I will be giving to it. OK, so I'll mention to my resource that the language of my speech will be English language. OK, from English language, I want to convert it to other languages. So what are those other languages? Let me go ahead and let me mention my target languages as well. So from English, I want to convert it to which language? So I will say uh, one is Hindi language. OK, so I'll mention the code for Hindi, which is HI. Then from English, I want to convert it to French language. So I'll mention the code for it, which is French uh, FR. Then from English, I want to convert it to Spanish language. So I'll mention the code for Spanish, which is ES. And then from English, I might want to convert it to Kannada language. So for uh, the code for Kannada is KN. Okay, you can get the code of these languages from the documentation page of Azure. All right. Now, let me ask the user to enter a target language of their choice. Okay, enter a single target language of their choice. Enter a single target language of their choice. If they want to convert it to Hindi, then I will say mention a code called HI. If they want to convert it to French, then mention a code called FR. If they want to convert it to Spanish, then mention a code called ES. And if they want to convert it to Kannada, then mention a code called KN. All right. So the computer will ask the user to enter a target language of their choice. Whatever is the target language, I'll just save it in this variable. OK, let's see whether it is asking me to enter a target language or not. I'll try to run the coding file. And you can see it is asking me to enter a target language. I'll do one thing. Uh, it's asking me to enter it on the same line. So let me introduce a new line at the end. So that my input is taken in a new line from here and 
not from here, but from new line, it should start. Okay, that's why I've mentioned a code uh, at the end. Okay, uh, which suggests that new line should be inserted. Okay, let me go ahead. Let me run my coding file again and let's see whether that is happening. Yes, that is happening. Now the input is being asked in a new line. Also, I'll do one thing. This entire statement is seeming very big. So why don't I divide it into multiple lines? That will make it more readable. Okay, so I'll just divide it into multiple lines, which will make this statement more readable. Okay, I'll run the coding file. Okay, now the statement is more readable. All right, so it is asking me to enter target language. I'll enter something. Okay, and whatever I will enter, it will be saved inside this variable. Fine, then next, what do I want to do? So I will say that if the target language mentioned by the user is any one out of the four specified target languages. Okay, earlier I have specified four target languages. So I'll say if the target language mentioned by the user is any one out of the four specified target languages, then only do the translation work or else do nothing. So I'll mention a command called pass signifying that do nothing. So what I'm what am I saying? I'm saying that if the target language mentioned by the user is any one out of the four specified target languages, then only do the translation. Otherwise, do nothing. OK, fine. So if the target language mentioned by the user is any one out of the four specified target languages, then I want to do the translation. How will I do it? Let me mention it. So first I will have to mention uh, uh, the details of my speech because I will be giving a speech as an input to the resource, right? I'll be passing my speech as an input to my resource. All right, so I'll mention the uh, settings of that. Okay, so how will I be getting that speech? So I'll say that my speech should be recorded from my default microphone. Okay, so I'll say use default microphone and from my default microphone, get the speech. So here I have mentioned the settings. Okay, that the user will give a speech and I've mentioned the settings of that speech. Okay, uh, now that speech will be taken and it will then translate that speech to other language. But in order to translate, I will have to make the resource ready for translation. So let me make the resource ready to do translation. Okay, so over here, I'll call this class called uh, translation recognizer class. Okay, and what it will do is it will make the resource ready, but which resource I want to make it ready. So I've already gained access to my resource, that resource I want to make it ready. And I'll say to that resource that uh, the user will give a speech from the default microphone. So take that speech and then do the translation. Okay. So with this code, what will happen is the resource will be ready to do translation. Okay, it will just be ready to do translation. Now that it is ready to do translation, I will ask the user that, OK, the resource is ready to do translation. So speak, please speak now. OK, please speak now. So the user will speak something. Now, whatever the user is speaking, I would want my resource, which is ready to do translation. I would want that resource to recognize the speech in one go. OK, so whatever the user is speaking without break, that speech will be captured by the resource. The resource will then convert that speech. It will translate it. And whatever is the translation result, I want to get the translation result back. So let's see the translation results. I'll go ahead and print the translation results to you. Let's see the raw translation results. OK, let's see. Obviously, the raw translation result at first will not make sense to you. But don't worry, we will try to refine those raw results. First, let's see the raw translation results. I'll try to run my coding file. It is asking me to enter a target language. Let me mention something like Hindi. So I'll mention the code for Hindi, which is HI. OK, now let's see. Then it will ask me to speak something, so I'll speak something to it, OK? OK, by the way, I'm getting an error. Let's try to understand why is that error. It seems that there might be some spelling mistake or no, no spelling mistake. I guess this setting, I will have to pass it with help of a, a parameter called audio config. Let me pass it with help of that parameter. Okay, now it should work. 
I'll go ahead, run my coding file. It is asking me to enter a target language. After this, the resource will ask me to speak something. So I'll speak something to it. Okay. Hello. Good morning. All right. So I've spoken something. It has done some translation work, and you can see the results over here. Okay. Uh, let me also do one thing. Apart from seeing the translation results, let me also print information about the actual text. Okay, the original text. So I'll just print that information over here. I'll say this is the original text of what the user has spoken. Okay, let's print out that information. Let's see now. Over here, the resource will ask me to speak something, so I'll speak to it. Hello, I am in a session of AI 102. All right, so you can see my original text, okay, the text of my original speech, and below you can see the translation also. By default, what it is happening is you can see uh, my speech is taken, that speech is converted to text, as you can see. And that text is converted to text of your multiple target languages. Okay, so for example, you can see uh, the translated text in Hindi language, then the translated text in French language, then the translated text in Spanish language, then the translated text in Kannada language. Okay, so you can see the translation in multiple target languages. So uh, uh, what has happened is the first three steps have uh, been performed. Okay, it's just that the last step is remaining, which is to convert this text to speech. How to do that? I'll show that to you. Okay, so let me show that to you. By the way, uh, I'm only interested uh, instead of uh, getting translation of multiple target languages, I only want to get translation of my specified target language. So let's suppose my specified target language is Hindi, then I only want to get that translation in Hindi. And that translation in Hindi, I want to convert it to speech. Okay, so what I'm saying is instead of getting the translation in all the specified target languages, I only want the translation in my specified target language. Okay, so what to do? So where I'll just write the code for uh, getting the translation in my target language. So I'll say based on the target language mentioned by the user, get the translated text. Okay, and I'll just print it over here to you. So over here, I'll say that this is the translated text. Okay, let's see whether that is happening or not. I'll try to run my coding file. I'll enter a target language, let's say Hindi. Then the resource will ask me to speak something, so I'll speak something to it. Hello, my name is Smith Shah. Okay, currently I'm getting an error. The reason being that I should add a S at the end for translations. Okay. And after this, this code should work. Hello, how are you? Okay. Uh, okay, it has not taken my changed code because my coding file has not been saved as indicated by this large white dot over here. So let me press Control S to save the coding file. And then let me run the code again. Hello, we are in a session of AI 102. Okay, and you can see the translated text over here. Okay, I can try it again. Hello, my name is Smith Shah. Okay, it has taken Nisha. Okay, that should not be the case. Let me ask it again. I'll speak properly this time. Hello, my name is Smith Shah. Okay, this time it has correctly taken my name. All right. Fine, so you can see the original text, then the translated text. So out of the four steps, three steps are already done. My speech was converted. My speech of English language was converted to text of English language. That text of English language was converted to text of Hindi language. Now that text of Hindi language, I want to convert it to speech again. So how to do it? Let's see. 
So in order to convert it back to speech, I will have to use some predefined voices that are available in Azure. Okay, so for different different languages, Azure has recorded voices. Uh, Azure has recorded different different voices. So for Hindi, one of the voices that Azure has recorded is called Madhur Neural. Let me show that to you. Okay, so I will say Azure speech so speech. I'll just mention your text to speech and I just want to show you the names of the voices. OK, let me show that to you. I hope the documentation. Is available here. Uh, text to speech. I want to show you the different voices. OK, why don't I search by voice name? I guess that way I'll be better able to give you the documentation link. So one of the voices is Madhur Neural. I want to search about it. I want to show you the documentation of that. Madhur Neural then uh, for Spen, a French there is Elvira Neural. Like that, there are multiple voices. Huh, this is the documentation link or not. Huh, this is the one. Yes. So you can see, guys, uh, for Hindi, one of the voices is Madhur Neural. You can see that. OK, uh, like this for different, different languages, there are different, different voices. OK, each having different pitch, different tone. You can use any voice that you like. So for Hindi, you can use any of the voices available for Hindi language. OK, I'll just mention that voice name over here. Similarly, uh, for French, we have a pre-recorded voice called Henry Neural. OK, let me prove that to you. I'll just search for Henry Neural. You can see for French, I have multiple voices. One of them is Henry Neural. OK, so I'll just take this voice code and mention it in my coding file. Similarly, for Spanish, there is one voice code called El Elvira Neural. I'll just mention the voice code for it. Elvira Neural. I'll also prove this to you. Let me search for Elvira Neural. OK, and here it is. Similarly, for Kannada, I guess one of the voices is Gagan Neural, if I'm not wrong. Yes, for Kannada, one of the voices is Gagan Neural. OK, so let me take that voice code and mention it in my coding file. All right, so with this, I've mentioned the voices that I want to use for different different languages. Now let's proceed ahead. Okay. Now um, I will have to mention this setting in my resource that if the target language mentioned by the user is Hindi, then use Madhur neural voice. If the target language mentioned by the user is French, then use Henry neural voice. If the target language mentioned by the user is Spanish, use Ervila neural voice. So this setting I will have to specify it to the user. So in order to perform that configuration in the resource, I will require to perform authentication again. Let's perform that authentication again. Uh, this authentication that I am performing right now is to perform configuration within the uh, speech resource. And in order to perform configure, uh, in order to perform that authentication. I'll require two things. One is the key of the resource. Second is the region in which the resource lies. Using the two things, authentication will be performed. And hopefully, I should gain access to perform configuration in the resource. OK, hopefully, I get access to perform configuration in the resource. Once I gain access to perform configuration in the resource, I'll just mention to the resource that which voice do you have to use? So I'll just mention to the resource that which voice do you have to use? So I'll just say that depending on the target language mentioned by the user, get the voice from this particular dictionary. Okay, depending on the target language mentioned by the user, get the voice from this particular dictionary. So if the target language mentioned by the user is Hindi, use Madhur neural voice. If the target language mentioned by the user is FR, use Henry neural voice and so on. All right, after this, I'll just make the resource ready to speak. OK, I've mentioned the configuration that which voice 
it should use to speak. Now let me make it ready to speak back to me. So for that, I'll use this class called speech synthesizer. With that, I'll just make the resource ready to speak something back to me. Okay, which resource I want to make it ready? The same resource uh, in which I have made this configuration change. That same resource I want to make it ready to speak. Um, with this, the resource will be ready to speak back. Once the resource is ready to speak back, what I will do is I will ask the resource to speak something. But what to speak? Okay, so I will say, speak what is written in the translated text. Okay, so we have already got translated text in step number three. That means at this particular step, we have already got the translated text. That translated text, I want my resource to speak back. Okay, so I'll do one thing. I'll save my translated text inside of this variable. And that particular translated text, I want my resource to speak. And whatever it speaks, I want to get that speech so that uh, you and me can hear it. Okay, this is it. I'll just go ahead, save the coding file. Try to run my code. Let's see what is that. It is asking me to enter a target language. So I'll enter it. By the way, guys, I'll have to do one thing. In order for you to hear the speech back, I'll have to do a change in uh, the Teams app. So this time, I will unshare my screen, share it again. But while sharing it again, I will also include a setting. I will also select this setting called include sound so that you can also hear the speech. Okay, otherwise would have not been able to hear the speech back. Okay, now let me run the coding file. It is asking me to enter a target language. I'll do that. Then the resource will ask me to speak. So I will speak something to it. Okay, so let me speak something to it. Hello, we are in a AI 102 session. Hello, we are in an AI 102. Okay, were you able to hear the translated speech back? So with this, step number four has also been done. Were you able to hear it back, guys? I was able to hear it. Okay, I can see thumbs up from you. Okay, so it seems that you are able to hear it. Fine. So with this, we have seen a demo of speech service. Okay, uh, the same code, if you run it in your laptop, it will work. All right. So this was the demo of speech service. Okay, so you can see here, it's just a ready-made AI model that you're using for your task. Okay, nothing fancy. And that's what your AI 102 curriculum is all about, working with ready-made AI models. So what we have done is, we have learned what is AI. Okay, we have learned what is AI. And uh, so let me put a tick mark over here. And then we have also seen the demo of speech service. Now let me go ahead and let me give you a demo of vision service. So what will we do now? We'll just go ahead and see a demo of vision service. So let's do that. So since I want to work with vision service, I will go ahead and uh, create a resource of the vision service. In Azure, there is a rule that whenever you want to um, use any uh, service, you have to go ahead and create a resource of it. By the way, can anyone mention in the chat, what is vision service used for? Speech service was used to translate speech from one language to another. What is vision service used for? Can anyone mention it in the chat? What is vision service used for? What is the use of vision service? Can anyone mention it? As Ravi has correctly mentioned, vision service is used to analyze images and videos. What we'll do today is we'll try to analyze images. Okay, what we'll do today is we'll try to analyze images. So let's do that. So I'll show you how to do it. So I just want to show you the documentation page first. So you can see there are many things available under analysis. One thing that it allows you to do is it uh, it allows you to ask Azure to create a customized model based on your needs. So let's say I want to create a customized uh, image classification model that distinguishes between apple versus a banana. Okay, so it can create that model for me. But you won't have any control over the behind the scenes mathematics of the uh, algorithm. 
okay you will just ask azure to create a model based on your requirement okay but it's up to azure how it creates that model so you won't have any control over how that model will be created behind the scenes what mathematics will be used you won't have any control over it so if you feel that your model is not working well as per your expectation there is nothing you can do okay fine so you can ask azure to create a customized model based on your requirements you can just specify your requirements and azure will create that type of models for you next thing that you can do is you can read text from images okay then you can also detect people in images you can generate image captions okay then you can detect objects okay so image by image caption what do i mean so if you just pass a image uh, then based on that image uh, it will try to figure out what is happening in it so for example in the image cows are grazing in a field and that's the exact caption that has been generated by the vision resource okay similar you can go ahead and detect objects there are multiple things you can do i'll just give you a link of this documentation in the chat let's do one thing over here what we will do is we'll try to read text from images okay that's one thing that we'll do fine so let's see how to do that so i guess i have uh my images with me in which i have text yes here i have it i'll just copy those images and paste it in my working folder let me do that all right so here are those images let me show them to you so you can see this is one image where some text is written this is another image where some text is written Okay, so we'll be trying to uh, read text from these images. Let's see how to do that. So I'll create a coding file over here. I'll call it analyze.py. All right. And since I want to work with the vision service, what I'll first have to do is create a resource of that vision service. So I'll try to search for vision service. Now you can see there are two options available related to vision service. One is custom vision. Next is computer vision. Custom vision option needs to be chosen, uh, needs to be selected. If you want to ask Azure to create a customized model for you. However, if you want to work with any ready-made model available inside of Azure, then you have to select the computer vision option. Okay, with that, you will be able to work with ready-made models that are already made by Azure. Okay. So since in my current uh, lab demonstration, I want to work with a ready-made model that reads text from images. Let me select the computer vision option. Okay. I'll select the computer vision option and I'll create a resource of this service. Now, when I try to do that, I'm redirected to a form that I have to fill. So let me fill in the details of the form over here. Okay, I'll just go ahead and fill in the details of the form. Let me do that. Okay, again, as you can see, with respect to pricing tier, there are two options available free and standard. With free tier, you will not be charged for usage. However, with uh, the uh, so that's the advantage of free tier, which is that it is free for use. However, the disadvantage of free tier is that there will be a lot of limitations with respect to usage. So, for example, you can see the limitation of free tier is uh, you can call the resource 20 times per minute. Whereas in standard tier, you will be charged for usage. So that's a disadvantage of standard tier. You will have to pay some charge for usage. However, however in standard tier, uh, that limitation that, uh, I mean, many of those limitations of free tier do not exist. So for example, in free tier, the limit was 20 times usage of the resource per minute. Whereas in standard tier, you can see uh, the limitation. It says 10 times per second. And in a minute, we have 60 seconds. So 10 into 60, that means in a minute, you can call the resource 600 times. Okay, fine. So let's suppose you have built an application uh, through which people can use the vision resource. So maybe in a minute, it could happen that uh, uh, multiple people are using your application. So they will be able to access the resource multiple times and it might happen that this resource has been accessed more than uh, six, uh, let's say 20 times per minute. In that scenario, what will you do? Your free tier will not be uh, uh, 
uh, enough for you okay so you can go ahead and jump to standard tier if you like okay i'll just jump to standard tier right away i will have to pay some cost for usage but that's fine for me okay let me move forward now and i'll just go ahead and click on review plus create button with this azure will run a validation in the backend just to check if it can give me the things that i'm asking for if the validation is successful then the create button will be enabled and now you can see it has been enabled i'll click on it and with this a resource of my vision service will be created i will have to wait for around one or two minutes and soon the resource of vision service will be created for me As I mentioned, we'll have to wait for one or two minutes. Okay, now the resource has been created. Let me go to the resource. Again, just like with speech resource, there were two ways to interact with the speech resource, right? One is using the without code approach. Second is using the with code approach. Even here, there are two ways. Using the without code approach and then using the with code approach. If you want to use the without code approach, you can just click on this button called go to studio and you can do your task without code. Let's suppose I want to read uh, text from images. So I'll click on this button called extracting text from images. Upload my file where some text is written. OK, so I'll upload my file where a text is written. Let's say this file. And it will extract text from the image and you can see it has done that over here. OK, so this is the without code approach. You can also use the with code approach. It's up to you. OK. You can see the documentation link if you want to try out the with code approach. Let me try out the with code approach over here. OK, so in order to use the with code approach, I'll first have a coding file. Now, currently I have a coding file with me. Which is inside of my laptop. And I want to access the vision resource that is present on Azure. So currently there is no link between my coding file and the vision resource. So in order for my coding file to access the vision resource, I will have to perform some authentication. So in order to perform authentication over here, I will require two things. One is the key of the vision resource and second is the endpoint of the vision resource. OK, fine. So these are the two things that I'll require to gain access to the vision resource. Fine, let's go ahead and uh, let's mention those two things. So first is the key of the vision resource. I'll just go ahead and mention the key. And then the second is the endpoint of the vision resource. Endpoint is nothing but the link of that resource. OK, so I'll just copy the endpoint and paste it over here. All right, using these two things, I'll try to gain access to the vision resource. Let's see whether that is happening or not. Okay, now in order to gain access, what will I have to do? Okay, let's try to understand it. Okay, so in order to gain access, um, what are the, uh, what is the class that you will have to call? Okay, so currently using the key of the resource and using the endpoint of the resource, I'll try to perform authentication. So for that, I'll require a class which I will import. So from Azure folder, there is a subfolder called AI. Inside that subfolder, there is another subfolder called vision. Inside it, there is a file called image analysis. From that file, I will try to import this class called image analysis client. Now I'll just go ahead and call that class. The first thing that I have to do is I have to pass the endpoint of my resource. The second thing that I have to do is I have to pass the key of my resource, but I can't pass the key directly. I will have to pass it with help of a function. As per rules, uh, here I cannot pass the key directly, so I'll have to pass it with help of another function. So let's do that. I'll try to import that function. So from Azure folder, there is a subfolder called core. Inside that, there is a file called credentials. And from that file, I will try to import this function called Azure key credential. OK, I'll just go ahead, call that function. Uh, and through that function, I'll pass the key of my resource. If authentication is successfully performed, then access to resource will be granted. 
and if access to resource is granted, then I just want to print a confirmation message to the user that access has been granted. Okay, access to resource has been granted. I'll try to run my coding file. There are multiple ways to run the coding file. First is by clicking on the run button. There are other ways also that I'll show to you. Okay, let me click on the run button. Okay, you can see access to resource has been granted. Let me clear the terminal because you can see the output of previous run as well. Let me clear, clear the terminal and then run the coding file fresh. Okay, and you can see access to resource has been granted. This was one way to run the coding file. What is another way? Let me show that to you. So first make sure, uh, so in the second way, what you have to make sure is, make sure that your terminal is pointing to the main parent folder where your coding file is present. So here my parent folder is this folder called vision. So I'll right click on it and then select this option called open in terminal. With this, what will happen is the terminal will point to that particular folder. Now in that folder, I have a file called analyze.py. So I'll say, please run that coding file called analyze.py. This is another way to run the coding file. One way was by clicking on the run button. Second way is by mentioning this command. Whichever way you're fine with, you can use it. Okay, now let me go ahead and let me try to analyze uh, my image. And what do I want to do within analysis? I want to read text from image. Okay, so which image uh, do I want to read text from? So I'll mention the path of that image over here. So I'll say inside the images folder, there is a file called lincoln.jpg that is the image on which i want to perform analysis now um, the image data that i'll pass to the resource for performing analysis that image data has to be in hexadecimal format so i'll have to make sure that whatever image data i'm passing to the resource has to be in hexadecimal format let's see how can we get the data in hexadecimal format so i'll say open the image Okay, and what do I want to do after opening? I want to read the image in such a way that I get the data in hexadecimal format. So I'll mention a code for a code, a code over here called RB, which stands for read binary, and it will read the data inside this file in such a way that the data will be read as data will be read in hexadecimal format. Okay, so you will get the image data in hexadecimal format. Let me print that image data to you just so that you can cross check whether you are getting the data in hexadecimal format or not. And here you can see the image data will be obtained in hexadecimal format as you can see. Okay, you can see the image data in hexadecimal format. Okay, so the resource expects that whatever image data you are passing has to be in hexadecimal format. So we'll take care of that rule. Now let's move forward. Now I will ask my resource that, okay, now that you are ready to perform analysis, please go ahead and analyze this image. So I'll have to pass the data of the image on which I want to perform analysis. So I'll pass that data. Then I will mention, what do I want to analyze? What is the feature that I want to analyze? So currently I just want to do one thing, which is to read text from images. So in order to mention that feature, I will have to perform another import over here. So let me perform that import from this library. So I'll perform that import. This import is necessary to mention the feature that you would want to analyze. So I'll say, which feature do I want to analyze? I want to just read text from images. Okay, so this is the command that I'll be passing just to mention to my resource that I just want to read text from images. Okay. That's it. Uh, then the image will give you some uh, results. You can go ahead, get your results. Okay, I'll just print the results over here. Let's see. Okay, I'll do one thing. I don't want to see the image data in hexadecimal format. I'll remove that print statement. And now let me run the code. Okay. And let's see the raw results that will be obtained. Currently, have a look at the raw results. Obviously, the raw results will not make sense to you at first, but we'll try to refine it. Okay, so currently, there are multiple things that are obtained over here. So what I will do is, I will say that in the results, whatever blocks of code have been read, print information about it. 
let's see what do we get. Okay, currently I'm getting a data in the form of a list. Right, as indicated by square bracket at the end and square bracket at the starting. Okay, so currently I'm getting this entire output in the form of a list. I will say give me the first value inside of the list. Python developers would know that in order to get first value inside of the list, we have to use index zero. So I'll just mention index zero over here. Okay. And uh, I will say print information up. Okay. After that, what to do? I will just show that to you. Now let's see what is happening. Okay. Now I will say give me information about uh, the various lines of text that you have read. So I'll just mention this command called lines and it will give me information about various lines of text that we have read. Let's see. All right, so there's the information about first line. In that line, there are multiple words. First word is in, second word is this, third word is temple, okay. Then below that we have information about second line. In the second line, we have different different words. Okay. Then after that, we have information about third line and so on. Okay. So there are multiple lines of text that are read. So I will say for every line of text that you are reading, make sure that you print information about each word one by one. Okay. So also make sure that you print information about each word one by one. Okay, let's see whether we are able to do that or not. Okay, and you can see we are able to do that. Uh, I'll also make sure that one thing happens. This earlier print statement, I'll just remove it. And then I will run the code again. Okay, now have a look. Now you can see information about each word one by one. Okay, uh, so I'll just do one thing. I was not able to scroll above. Let me run the code again so I get a particular output. Ah, okay, so this is the information about first word. Then below that is the information about second word. Then below that is the information about third word, then fourth word, and so on. So you can see I'm able to read text inside of images. Okay. Fine. And you can see for each of those words, the coordinates of the words are mentioned. Okay. So uh, if you want, uh, you can, if you want to draw rectangles over the words, you can do that with help of these coordinates over here if you want to. Okay. That's up to you. Fine. So I just wanted to prove to you that yes, you can go ahead and uh, analyze images using the vision service. So this is one demo of vision service. There are multiple things that you can do over here. Okay, one was reading text from images. The second was detecting objects in images, multiple things. I have mentioned the documentation link in the chat so you can refer it. So with this, I've shown you one demo of vision service, right? Now, uh, let's go ahead and uh, two services are left now, okay? Uh, so we have document intelligence service. We'll see demo of that. Then we also have open AI service. So we'll see demo of that as well. All right, let's go ahead and let's now talk about document intelligence service. Guys, can anyone mention to me what document intelligence service does? What will it help me to do? So speech service was used to translate speech from one language to another. Vision service was used to um, Analyze images or analyze videos. What will be the what will the document intelligence service help you to do? As um, Ravi and Vish have correctly mentioned, that a document intelligence service will help me to scan documents and extract information out of it. Okay, it will help me to scan documents and extract information out of it. Fine. So let's see how to do that. So let's suppose I have a document with me. Let's suppose I have a document with me. Let me show you that document. Uh, 
Okay, I'll just go ahead show you the document here. Okay, have a look at the document. Here it is. You can see it's an invoice document. Okay, so what I'll do is I'll pass it to the document intelligence service so you can scan it. And then if I ask it to fetch any information out of it, it should able it should be able to do that. So let's see how to do it. So since I want to work with document intelligence service, what will I have to do? I will have to go ahead and create a resource of that service. So let me search for document intelligence service on Azure. And I will try to create a resource of that service. Let me do that. So uh, when I try to create a resource, I'm redirected to this form that I have to fill. So let me go ahead and let me fill in the details of the form. So I'll just go ahead and fill in the details of the form over here. OK, let me fill in the details. All right, and now I will ask Azure to create the resource for me. So Azure is running our validation currently just to check whether it can give me the things that I'm asking for. If the validation is successful, then the create button will be enabled. And now you can see the create button has been enabled. Let me click on it. And with this, a resource of document intelligence service will be created. And uh, by the way, uh, Although I cannot share you the coding files in the chat, but I'm just checking whether I can share my code directly so that you can try it out. So let me show you the code directly. So guys, just take this code. This is the code of speech service. I've just pasted in the chat. Let me also share the code of uh, vision service. But first try the code of speech service. Try it in your own laptop. See if it's working or not. It will work, but you can try it if you want. All you have to do is just take my code and run it. OK, although separately, as I mentioned, these coding files I will upload on Google Drive folders and share the link of that Google Drive folder to you. Uh, but till that time, you can take my code and run it in your laptop and see whether it's working or not. OK, so I've shown you a demo of speed service. I've shown you a demo of vision service. Now let me show you a demo of document intelligence service. So again, just like earlier, uh, just like for other so, uh, resources, in order to access it, there were two options. One is using the without code approach. Second is using the with code approach. Similarly, with respect to document intelligence service, also there are two options. One is using the without code approach. Second is using the with code approach. In order to access the document intelligence resource without any code, you just have to click on this button called Go to Studio, and you will be able to interact with your resource without any code. Okay. However, I always prefer the with code option, so let me do that. Let me show you the with code option. The reason I prefer the with code option is I can customize the results the way that I want. See the analysis results you will get in the with code approach as well as in the without code approach. It's just that in the with code approach, you will be able to customize the results the way that you want. That's why I always prefer the with code approach. Okay, anyways, let me create a coding file over here. I'll call it test.py. Okay, and uh, I'm going to interact with the document intelligence resource with code. So in order to gain access to the resource, I will require two things. OK, what are those two things? So guys, in order to gain access to the vision resource, what were the two things that I required? Anybody remembers? In order to perform authentication to the vision service, what were the two things that I required? Same two things are required to perform authentication to document intelligence resource as well. So in order to gain access to the vision resource, what were the two things that were required? Anybody remembers? What were the two things that were required to perform authentication to vision service? Vish has given the correct answer. Vish has correctly mentioned key and endpoint. Those were the two things required to gain uh, access to vision resource. 
Similarly, in order to gain access to document intelligence resource, I'll require those two things over here. OK, so let me mention the key of the resource. I'll mention the key of the resource over here. I'll copy the key, paste it in my coding file. And the next thing that I'll do is I'll mention the endpoint of the resource, which is nothing but the link of my resource. OK, now in order to perform that authentication, uh, in order to perform that authentication, I'll require a class which I will import. So let me go ahead and let me import that class. So from Azure folder, there is a subfolder called AI. From that subfolder, we have a file called form recognizer. And from that file, I will import uh, this class called document analysis client. OK, next I'll just go ahead and call that class. Now uh, there are two things that I'll have to pass to perform authentication. First is the endpoint of my resource and next is the key of my resource. But as per rules, I cannot pass the key directly. I will have to pass it with help of a function that I will import. OK, if you remember with respect to vision resource also, I had to do the same exact thing. I had to take help of this function called Azure key credential. And through that function, I used to pass the value of my key. All right, so with you by using these two things, the endpoint of the resource and the key of the resource, authentication will be performed. If authentication is successful, then access to resource will be granted. And if access is granted, then I'll just print a confirmation message to the user that access has been granted. OK, let's see if that is happening or not. I'll try to run the coding file. And it says that access to resource has been granted. OK, now let me go ahead and uh, using the resource, I'll try to perform analysis. OK, let's see how to do that. So first, uh, I will have to mention the name of the model that I'll use to perform analysis. So guys, remember in document intelligence service, there are multiple models that are available for different different type of documents. So in order to work with your Aadhaar card document, PAN card document, there's a different model. In order to work with your invoice document, there's a different model. So in order to work with your invoice document, there is a model called pre-built invoice. OK, we have a model called pre-built invoice. Let me show you that documentation. I'll just show you the documentation page. OK. So you can see for working with invoice, I have a model called pre-built invoice. Similarly, guys, let's suppose if you want to work with something like Aadhaar card, PAN card, OK? Let's say if you want to want to work with Aadhaar card, PAN card. In that scenario, you will use this model called pre-built ID document. But currently, in my scenario, I just want to work with invoices. And in order to work it work with invoices, I'll use this model called pre-built invoice. So I'll just take the model ID and mention it in my coding file. Let me mention it in my coding file over here. OK. Uh, the next thing that I'll do is I'll mention that in this uh, invoice that I'll be scanning, uh, the details are written in which language? So I'll say that the details are written in English language. Then what is the URL of the document that you want to read? So guys, it's not necessary that you download the document in your local laptop, then only you will be able to pass it to the resource. Not necessary. If you just have a link of the document, so for example, this invoice document has been obtained from this particular GitHub link. OK, uh, I'll just mention the link in the chat for you. OK, so if you even pass that link in your code, that's fine. OK, so let me pass the document link over here. I'll go ahead and pass the document link. OK, uh, then next. Uh, uh, 
what do i want to do i just want to now ask my resource i have already gained access to the resource so i just want to ask it to begin analysis so i'll say please begin analyzing the document from the url but which model will be used this particular model called pre built invoice what is the url of the document let me pass that url uh, then in that document the uh, what is the language the language is english okay and uh, with this analysis will be performed then next what i want to do is i want to go ahead and get the results of the analysis so i'll say please get the result of the analysis and whatever is the result i'll do one thing i will save it in a variable i'll call it result from resource and whatever is the result let me print that raw result to you okay now let me run the coding file and let's view the raw results the raw result will not make sense to you at first and you can see the raw results over here okay we'll have to refine the raw results so let me do one thing i'm getting a lot of output over here in my terminal okay uh, i will just say that i will just mention over here uh, that give me information about uh the uh the information about what you have found in the document okay so let's see now again this will be a raw data that i will be getting i'll try to run my coding file this will be a raw data that i a raw result that i'll be getting it won't make sense to you at first we'll try to refine it don't worry okay you can see this entire result over here lot of things we are getting okay let me refine it more so this time what i will do is i will say um show me this result in the form of a dictionary so i will use the enumerate function to do that okay i will use the enumerate function to do that so this entire result i want to show it in the form of dictionary dictionary is nothing but a collection of key and value pair python developers would know that okay so the key i am referencing by this variable called id the value i am referencing by this variable called receipt field okay and then i will just say print information about the fields for which values have been obtained okay let's see so now you will get information about the fields for which values have been obtained okay you will just get information about the fields that what are their names what are the names of those fields okay currently uh, i'll just make sure that the above print statement is removed i don't want to see the result of the above print statement now let me run the coding file again okay it says to me that something is corrupted what is corrupted nothing should be corrupted i should get the results this this file is unsupported how i just passed the file it was working well is there some issue with my resource list of supported formats this is absolutely fine suddenly why am i getting this error let me even remove this code up till now the code was working well why does this file not supported okay let me print the analysis result let's see now okay i'm getting the raw data okay and what had happened previously okay i'm just converting this information in the form of a dictionary this is absolutely fine no issues at all why would i get a error here 
let's see now. Again, it says spy spy on supported. Uh, what could be the reason? What could be the reason? Any mistake that I am doing in my code? Any particular mistake? I don't think so. OK, let me do one thing. Yes. Let me see over here. Let me print information about the different receipt fields. OK, now I'll say. For every field, just give me the key value. Let's check. OK, now it's working. I don't know what had happened previously. OK, anyways, so where you are getting the names of the fields for which value has been fetched. So let's suppose I want to get a value for vendor name. OK, I am saying to my model that OK, you have scanned the document. Give me the vendor name mentioned in the document. I know that in my invoice with the vendor name is Contoso Limited. Hopefully my model also understands that. So let me print that information over here. I'll just say the vendor name is equal to this particular value. OK, so I'll just mention that get me the value. OK, of this field called vendor name. Get me the value. Of this field called vendor name. And hopefully it prints out Contoso Limited. If not, that means the model did an error. It should print out Contoso Limited because vendor name is Contoso Limited. Again, I'm getting an error. Why am I getting an error here? There is no mistake in my code. Vendor name is fine. Okay, in between it is giving me these errors, but this is completely fine. My code is completely fine, not an issue. Okay, I guess there is a issue with the region in which maybe I have deployed the model. Okay, you can see now it's working well. Okay, in between it will be these errors. Okay, anyways, uh, so you can see here the vendor name is Contoso Limited, exactly like I expected it to be. Let me print it in a much more readable manner. the terminal run the coding file again and you can see the vendor name is Contos Limited. You will be able to see that thing. OK, similarly, let's suppose I want to get uh, information about invoice ID. Now I know that my invoice ID is INV100. OK, but what if I don't want to check manually? I just want to ask the model to give me the invoice ID. I'll just go ahead and ask the model to do that. So I'll say give me the invoice ID. By using this invoice ID field, give me the value of that field. Let's see what it prints out. It should print INV100 for invoice ID. If not, that means the model did a mistake. It should print INV100. OK, and it does do that. OK, so like this, you can um, work with multiple files. If Pass it to the model for analysis. So if you have given your demo of a single file like this, uh, let's say using a Python loop, uh, you can ask multiple files to the resource and get information from the way that you want. All right. So with this, we have seen a demo of documented service. Okay, and uh, I'll just mention the. Document. I'll just give you the documentation to you. Just copy the link and share it in the chat. Okay, fine. So you can see, guys, for different different type of documents, there are different different type of ready-made models available. Or other card document, pan card document. There's a different model. Okay. Uh, for scanning Aadhaar card and PAN card documents, you use this model called pre-built doc, uh, ID document. 
Okay, like that, there are different, different models for different, different type of departments. Okay, if you feel that whatever model you are working with is, uh, uh, sorry, whatever document that you're working with, for that document, there is no model out there, uh, then you can also ask Azure to create a customized model. So you can go to, the, you can click on this link called Go to Studio and ask Azure to create a customized model for you. So let me show you how to do that. So for example, let's say I want to create a custom model. Okay. And I can ask Azure to create that custom model. So I'll create a project here. Let me call this webinar test. Select the subscription resource group, my document intelligence resource, and that's it. Okay. Training data. My training data, uh, is it expecting me to upload it to a storage account resource? Okay. So, guys, there is a separate service over here in Azure called storage account service. So it is asking me to upload data over there. So for those who are completely new to Azure, you can think of storage account service as something similar to Google Drive. Just like in Google Drive, you can upload any type of files. Similarly, in storage account service, you can upload any type of files. It is that Google Drive is made by Google company, storage account service is made by Azure company. So here it's asking me to create a resource of that service. You can create it from here or you can go to the home page of Azure and create a resource of storage account service. Okay. So this is another way to create that resource. Whichever approach you find, which, whichever approach you are working with, you can follow it. Okay. Here there is already a shortcut available to create a storage account resource. So I use that shortcut. Yeah. Let me mention the name of the storage account resource. The region, let me select uh, US US2, pricing tier is let's say locally redundant storage, LRS, locally redundant storage. With locally redundant storage, what will happen is let's suppose you have created your main resource in West US2. Then just for redundancy purposes, just to make sure that due to traffic or due to some other issue, uh, you are not getting any problem for accessing the resource. Just to ensure that copies of the resource will be created. Okay. And in locally redundant storage, what will happen is three copies will be created, but those copies will be created within the same location as the main one. Okay. So that is locally redundant storage. So the disadvantage of locally redundant storage is that what if all the servers of West US get destroyed? Will that with that your main resource will go? And along with that, your copy of the resource will also go. Okay, so uh, the advantage of uh, locally redundant storage is that it is much much cheap, much more cheaper. But the disadvantage is that uh, if let's say in that region there is a full outage, with that your main resource will go, and along with that, your copy of the resource will, will also go. Another type of uh, uh, redundancy is globally redundant storage, GRS. With that, what will happen is, let's suppose your main resource is stored somewhere in West US 2, then a copy of that resource will be made, but that copy will not be made in the same region as the main one. It will be made somewhere else, let's say somewhere in India, for example. So the benefit of this is, Let's say in West US 2, all the servers got destroyed. With that, your main resource won't be accessible, but at least you have a copy of the resource, which was created somewhere else apart from West US 2. Let's say somewhere in India and a different geolocation altogether. Okay. So there's the benefit, but the disadvantage is that it is much more costly. So to avoid on cost, I'll select locally redundant storage. Then within this storage account resource, I'm being asked to give a folder name or a container name. Container is nothing but a folder. Okay, just like in Google Drive, you can create folders. Here also, you can do that. 
Okay, so let me mention a folder name. Let's say data. Now within that folder, if you want to uh, want your data to be present in some subfolders, you can go ahead and mention the subfolder path below. Okay, you can go ahead and mention the subfolder path below. If you want to do it, I don't want to do that though. So I'll just leave it empty. Okay, fine. With this, a project will be created. And here I will show you that if at all you feel that uh, the document that you are working with, uh, for that document, there is no model available, ready made model available, then you can ask Azure to create a customized model for you. It's just that. Uh, We'll just mention your task, but uh, the behind the scenes mathematics you will have no control over. Okay, so we that model, whatever behind the scenes mathematics will be used, you will have no control. Uh, so let's suppose I want to train my document. So let's suppose I have a document over here. Let me see if I have some document with me. Let me check. Okay, I'll do one thing. I guess I should have my documents somewhere uploaded on Google Drive. Let me get those documents from there. Okay, let's say this is the document. I'll just download it. Okay, you can see it's a PDF document. Let's say you feel that for this PDF document, uh, there is a new ready-made model available. No worries. Okay, go to your document intelligence studio, upload your document. So I'll upload my document. And uh, then I will start labeling the values in the document. So I'll say run the layout. So it will scan the contents in it. And then I'll be able to uh, assign each value to a field. So for example, just like in case of an invoice document, we have these fields, right? Amount due, billing address, vendor name, these are different, different fields. Similarly, you can go ahead and add a field. You can say that this is total one field. Uh, to hotel one, what do you want to assign? Let me assign uh, the name of the first hotel over here, which is Dubai Hotels. Let me uh, pass this value to hotel one field. Similarly, I can create another field. Let's say hotel two field. So what is the second hotel recommended in this document? The second order that is recommended is the Creek hotel. Let me assign it to hotel two field and so on. Like this, you can go ahead and create different different fields, assign value to those fields. Okay, and once you are done with it, then you can go ahead and click on train button. With this, the model will be trained. Okay, so you can give it an ID. You, you, can, you can give it any ID that you want. I'll say Smith Custom Smith 001. Uh, then how do you want to build uh, the model uh, using neural network? That means using deep learning approach. Yes, I'll say using deep learning. Okay, because here the data set is complex, so I'll use the deep learning approach to train it. Okay, you can see the training is in progress. It will take a few minutes to train it. Once it has trained, you can even use that model uh, in your code for analysis uh, so that you can perform analysis using that model. So, this was just the demonstration that I wanted to show you. That if you feel that whatever document that you are working on is uh, for that document, there is no ready made model available, then you can ask Azure to create a custom model. Create this is the model ID. Remember, if you want to use your model in code, then you will have to mention the model ID. So for example, in order to work with this invoice related model, we use this model ID called pre built invoice. Let's suppose if you want to use your own model, then you will use this model ID. Okay, the one that you are specifying. Fine. So, guys, uh, this was the demo of document intelligence service. Okay.
With this, we have also seen that more document intelligence service. Now, before we go ahead, I just want to ask uh, if up till now it's making sense to you. Obviously, if you are new to Python, the syntax and everything, uh, you might be confused that why am I writing that syntax? Uh, but Python knowledge is a prerequisite for AI once you propose. Okay. But apart from that, I mean, is the concept making sense? So we have seen what is AI. I hope it was clear to you. When we saw demo of speech service, I hope that demo was clear to you. Then we saw demo of vision service. Then we saw demo of document intelligence service. I hope it's making sense. Yes, Vish. Okay, what about others? Making sense, Deepak, Paras, Yusuf, Salish. Yes, Pradeep, okay. Fine, so we'll do one thing, guys. We'll now take a break. After the break, we'll come back and we'll see our demo of last service of today, which is open AI service. Okay. So let's take a short break and after that, we'll be back. So I'll just start my clock. We'll take a break of 15 minutes and then we'll be back. So let's increase to 20 minutes. We'll take a break of 20 minutes and then we'll be back and we'll. Uh, Move on to our last service of the day. Right, so I'll just start the timer. Till the break, I'll just be on go.
Welcome back to this session, everyone. Hope all of you guys are back after the break. Just give me a confirmation in the chat whether you guys are back. Pratima, Pradeep, Vish. Everyone is back. Okay, I can see thumbs up from Dharampal. He's back. All right, so let's move ahead. So guys, now as per our agenda today, um, only one thing is left, which is to see demo of OpenAI service. So since we want to work with OpenAI service, what will we have to do? We'll have to go ahead and create a resource of that service, right? So let's do that. Let's create a resource of open AI service. So what I will do is I'll go to my Azure portal, try to search for open AI service. I can see an option for it in the search result. Okay, so I'll click on that. And now I'll try to create a resource of open AI service. So I'll click on the create button to do that. When I try to do that, I'm redirected to a form that I have to fill. So let me fill in the details of the form. The first field in the form is asking me to select subscription. The next field in the form is asking me to put my resource in some of the other resource group. Then I'm being asked to select the region for my resource. While selecting the region for your open AI resource, make sure that you choose it, choose it, uh, it wisely because different regions will have access to different open AI models. Okay, so it's not like in all the regions you will get access to all the open AI models. No, in different regions you have access to different open AI models. Let me um, show that to you. Okay, so if I just search for Azure Open AI region support, I should see the documentation of it. And here you will observe that different regions have different support for open AI models. Let me show you that. Uh, do we have an option for region support? Yes, here it is. OK, so you can see guys that different regions have access to different open AI models. In fact, uh, let me show you a bigger list. Yes, this one. All right, so you can see we have East US, which has access to many open AI models. In fact, uh, as far as support is concerned, um, East US is one region where you will get access to almost all the uh, important open AI models. OK, uh, but because it's so good, that's why many people try to use East US region to deploy their resource. And that's why since the last few months, there has been a lot of traffic issues in East US. So just for traffic, avoid East US. But apart from that, it is still East US is one of the best regions that you can choose. Okay, so you can see in different regions there are access to different open AI models. For example, uh, you have GPT uh, uh, for this one model. This model is not available in Australia East. It's not available in Canada East, but it's available in East US. OK, fine. So you can see the region wise availability over here. I'll just give you the documentation link so that you can refer it. Now let's move forward. And I'll just give um, I'll just select the region for my resource. Let me select something like West US. Then let me select the name of my resource. So let me mention a name. I'll just call it webinar. Open AI RES. After that, I'll choose the pricing tier. I'll click on next button. Now I'm being asked to uh, select network related settings. So the first option will ensure that your resource will be available using a public endpoint and anybody can access the resource provided that they have the necessary credentials. And up till now, all of our other resources also have been created in this manner only. Our resources have been uh, made available using a public endpoint and anyone uh, on the public internet can use the resource provided that they have the necessary credentials. Okay. On the other hand, the second option will ensure that uh, yes, your resource will be available on the public internet. Okay, so you will have a public endpoint.
but only selected networks will be able to access it. Okay, only selected networks will be able to access it. Normally what happens is when you're working in office, you have your own office network. So for example, I remember I was conducting a lecture for Walmart last week. So Walmart employees have their own uh, internet network to which they connect to. Okay, and uh, if you want that, your resource should only be available to your company's network, then you can mention that setting as well. Okay. Uh, whereas in the with the first option, anybody on the public internet can use your resource. Okay. Whereas in the second option, only people on the that are connected on your selected network will be able to use your resource. Okay. On the other hand, the third option is used to ensure uh, that actually, actually I should uh, uh, mention uh, the uh, explanation for networks in the third option over here because the second option is not about networks. I, I forgot to mention it. Okay, let me mention the explanation correctly. So I'll just remove this text that I annotated and let me mention the explanation again. So guys, with the first option, what happens is your resource is available using a public endpoint and anybody on the public internet can access it provided that they have the necessary credentials. On the other hand, in the second option, what happens is, yes, your resource is available using a public endpoint, but only specific IP addresses will be able to access your resource. Okay, only specific IP addresses will be able to access your resource. So let's say you only want your five team members to access the resource, then you will mention their IP addresses and only they will be able to access your resource. On the other hand, with the third option, what will happen is, uh, the resource will not be available using a public endpoint. Okay, so people on the public internet cannot access it. It will be available using a private endpoint. Okay, so only people connected to your private network will be able to access your resource. So that example that I was giving of Walmart, where uh, their employees are connected on their own private network. So let's say if you want uh, uh, that only your employees should access your resource, only employees of your company should access it, then you know that, okay, all of your employees will be connected to this private network and only people connected to this private network uh, should access your resource you can select the appropriate setting i will choose the first option only which is the default option uh, and let me go ahead and let me click on the next button after that i am being asked to do tag configuration okay so tags are nothing but name value pairs that you assign to the resource so just like if you are in a clothes shop right uh, if you observe every cloth has a tag assigned to it which gives more information about that cloth right similarly over here uh, let's suppose you are creating multiple resources, okay, and you want to find for a specific resource. You want to search for a specific resource. So let's suppose I have created multiple resources. Now I want to search for a resource that I created for my webinar. Now let's suppose I have 100 resources in my list. How will I know which OpenAI resource I created for webinar purpose, which I created for other purpose? One approach is you can obviously name the resource appropriately. So while naming the resource, you can take care of it. Okay, but you are suppose I have named it as webinar open EIRES. But how do I know that whether I am talking about the webinar conducted in the month of November, December, which one? So here I can give more information about the resource by assigning tags to it. Remember tags have to be assigned using tag name and tag value. So you can assign any tag name that you want, any tag value that you want. So let's suppose I will assign a tag name called created for so I'll say created for webinar. Uh, what was the uh, date? So I'll say it was created on 09-11-2024. Okay, so like this, you can assign multiple tags. It's up to you. I won't assign any tag over here, uh, but if you want to assign a tag, that's fine. Okay, I will leave tag section empty currently. Let me click on next button. Now Azure is running a validation in the backend just to check whether it can give me the things that I'm asking for. If the validation is successful, then the create button will be enabled. 
And now you can see the create button has been enabled. Let me click on it. And with this, a resource of OpenAI service will be created. Okay. Uh, Deepak has a query. Deepak says, will the recording be posted? Yes, Deepak. So recording will be, will be posted on our official YouTube channel. Okay. Um, you can contact our support team to know more about it. Uh, but the recording will be posted. So every webinars that we conduct, uh, those recordings do get posted on our official YouTube channel. So yes, the recording will be posted. All right. So over here, since I wanted to work with the OpenAI service, I tried to create a resource of it. You can see the resource creation is in progress. Okay, so we'll just wait for around one or two minutes and soon the OpenAI resource should be ready. So let's just wait for a few minutes. And just like all the other resources, guys, even for the open AI resource, there are two ways to access it. One is using the without code approach. Second is using the with code approach. I'll show you both the approaches. OK. So let me just wait. All right. And now, let me go to this resource. And as I mentioned, there are two ways to interact with the resource. One is uh, using the without code approach. Second is using the with code approach. Uh, let me show you the without code approach. So I'll click on this button called go to studio. And I'll show you how to interact with the open AI resource without code. Let me show you that. OK. Now, guys, um, using the OpenAI resource, there are two main type of models that you can work with. OK, so one is something called. Um, a chat completion models. Actually, the full name should be chat completion. OK, because in the documentation, the full name of these type of models are called chat completion models. So you have something called chat completion models. And then you have something called just completion models. What is the difference between completion models and chat completion models? So guys, in completion models, your models will not have the capability to remember chat history. OK, the models will not have the capability to remember the previous chat history. OK, so all the previous models that OpenAI made, uh, they did not remember previous chat history. OK. Whereas the new ones, okay, the ones that have been created lately, all of those models are called chat completion models. So chat completion models are those models that do remember previous chat history. Okay, that do remember previous chat history. Fine, we'll work with chat completion models only, which are the latest models. Okay, but in order to work with it, I will first have to deploy that model. Okay, so uh, I'll show you how to do that. OK, because currently without deploying that chat completion model, I, won't, uh, I will not be able to work with it. So I'll have to deploy that model first. OK, I'll show you how to do that. OK, this page is taking time. OK, you can see it is asking me to connect to a deployment. OK, and currently I have not deployed any model. So I'll click on uh, this deployment button over here. And I'll try to create a model. OK, I'll try. Sorry, I'll try to deploy a model. So let me do that. OK, so which model do I want to deploy? So I will say I want to deploy GPT 4.0 model. OK, this is the latest model. Uh, in fact, in your chat GPT tool, this is the model that is used internally. OK, previously it was using GPT 3.5. Now, obviously, uh, better models have been made by the opening IT. Okay, so let me deploy this model GPT 4.0 so that I can work with it later on. I'll just mention the deployment name. I'll say this is my first model that we have deployed. Okay, and let me deploy this model. Now that I will deploy this model, after deploying, I can go ahead and use it. Okay, so let's use it. So guys, uh, just like with just like how you can interact with chat GPT tool here. Yes, similarly, your interface is given to interact with the model. You can ask it what is 
Java programming language and it will give you the answer. Whatever question you have, just like you interact with chat GPT tool in a similar manner, you can interact over here. OK, uh, now let me show you one major thing, uh, which is to engineer the response. Um, just like the way that you want. OK, so let's suppose I want the response uh, to be provided in the way that I desire. OK, so let's suppose what I want to do. So let's assume that I want the model to give me sentiment of the user's input. OK, so whether the sentiment mentioned by the user is positive or negative, so on. OK, so for that, in order to give a general direction to the model, you can use this field called system message field. OK, this is called system message field. Through this, you can go ahead and give a general direction to the model. So I will say that I want the model to give the sentiment of the user's input. I want the model to give the sentiment of the user's input. OK, so let me go ahead and let me save my system message. And now you can see a new chat session has started. Now if I pass an input saying that this product is positive, so this product is good. OK, it should uh, uh, give me an output saying that the sentiment is positive, something like that it should give. And you can see it does give me the output exactly like I want. OK, so one is this system message field, which you can use to give a general direction to your model. OK, but let's suppose I want to do more customization. What I want is instead of giving the sentiment uh, using words, I want it to give sentiment using numbers. So what I want is for positive sentiment, I want a score of plus one. For negative sentiment, I want a score of minus one. For neutral sentiment, I want a score of zero. So let's suppose I'm working in Zomato team and Zomato has developed a feature wherein based on the reviews of the restaurants, you will cal uh, you will assign a score to those reviews. So if it's a positive review, assign a score of plus one to the restaurant. If it's a negative review, assign a score of minus one to the restaurant. If it's a neutral review, assign a score of zero to the restaurant and so on. OK, at the end, you will calculate your cumulative score and based on the cumulative score, your Zomato app will decide whether to promote this restaurant or to not promote it. OK, so let's suppose you're, you're working in Zomato and your Zomato team is thinking to implement this feature. OK, so they want that for every review. Uh, a score is provided. All right, let's see how to do it. Now, obviously, you can mention. Uh, your task through system message field, but if you feel that just through words, you will not be able to communicate your full story. Then you can go ahead and provide examples to the model. Just like if I'm explaining you and if I feel that through words, I'll not be able to convey the entire picture. I provide examples to you. Similarly, if you feel that to the model, you will not be able to communicate the entire picture through system message field. You can go ahead and add examples. How to do that? Let me show to you. So you can see over here below there is a. a option called add section. OK, and you can see there is a, a field to add examples. Over here. Let me add it. When I click on add examples button, two additional fields pop up. One is user message field. Second is assistant message field. What is user message field? User message field will act as example for the user's input. OK, example for the user's input. OK, whereas assistant message field will act as example for the output. OK, so through example, you can convey to the model that OK, if this type of input is provided, then provide that kind of output. If some other type of input is provided, provide other kind of output and so on. So I'll give examples. I'll say if the user gives a input saying that this product is uh, excellent, in that scenario, I want my model to give a score of plus one. OK, similarly. If the user gives an input saying that this product is bad. So in case of negative sentiment, I want my model to give me a score of zero. Similarly, if the user gives an input saying that this product is OK. However, it could have been better. 
so this is a mixed review neutral review in that scenario i want my model to give a score of 0 okay sorry so for positive review plus 1 for negative review score should be minus 1 and for a neutral review score should be 0 okay so you can see i have added examples over here i have added examples remember the user uh, message field will act as input for your example and assistant message field will act as output for your example okay fine now let me save these messages and now have a look guys now if i ask my uh, now if i pass an input to the model saying that this product is good it should now give me a score based answer for a positive review it should give me a score of plus one hopefully it does that let me pass it let's see whether it gives a score of plus one yes it does similarly let me pass a negative review i'll say that this keyboard stopped working after one day it is a scam do not buy it okay so this is a negative review right in case of negative review i want uh, the model to give me back a score of minus one let's see if it does that okay and you can see it does that over here okay uh, similarly you can give a negative review again you can say that this product was the worst okay or this product was so bad that i had to dump it in the garbage bin so this is a negative review in case of negative review i want my model to give me a score of minus one let's see if it does that and yes you can see it does that over here so what you are doing you are engineering the response of the model based on your prompt okay your prompt is nothing but your input that you are giving to the model okay prompt is nothing but the input that you are giving to the model so you are engineering the response of the model based on the prompt this is known as prompt engineering this thing that we just did over here is known as prompt engineering okay so prompt engineering basically means um, engineering the response of the model based on the prompt that you are giving okay so you can engineer it based by using these examples if you like okay fine so this was how you can interact with the uh, open ai model without code okay so you can also interact with the open ai model with code if you want to so let me show you how to do that okay so in order to interact with the open ai model with code what do you have to do let me show you okay so i'll create a subfolder over here I will call it OpenAI. Within that, I'll create a coding file called test.py. All right. And so currently, I have a coding file in my local laptop. And I want to access the OpenAI resource that is available on Azure. So currently there is no link between my coding file and the open AI resource that is available on Azure, right? So for my coding file to access the open AI resource, I will have to perform some authentication. So let's see how to do that over here. So again, in order to perform that authentication, I will require two things. First is the key of the resource. Second is the region, uh, sorry. Second is the endpoint of the resource. So let me mention those two things. First is key of the resource. And second is endpoint of the resource. Okay, endpoint of the resource is nothing but the link of the resource. All right. Now uh, I will need help of a Python class that will help me to perform this authentication. So from OpenAI file, there is this Python class called Azure OpenAI. This class will help me to perform authentication to the OpenAI resource. Okay, so I will pass the endpoint of my resource first. Then I will pass the key of my resource. Okay, and remember that since I'm using the coding based approach, or 
uh, the API based approach. You are able to pass the API version. So OpenAI service has created different different APIs so that there is no traffic on just one API. OK, so there are different different versions. I'll use a version of 2023 OK, like this, there are different versions guys. So let me show you the documentation of different API versions. I'll just search for it. I'll do open EI. Yeah. OK, and here you can see guys the documentation. So you can see for chat completion models, you know the difference between chat completion and just completion. In just completion models, uh, your models do not support remembering previous chat history. Whereas in chat completion models, your models do support remembering previous chat history. OK, fine. And you can see in chat completion models, uh, there are various APIs. Uh, I use this API 2023 It was created on 15th of May 2023. OK, ideally I would urge you to avoid these preview uh, APIs because they might be retired uh, sooner. OK, so uh, many of these preview APIs do get retired after a few months. Okay, so try to avoid them. Uh, use a stable uh, API version so that if let's say you have built a software and in that software you have hard coded your API version, you do not want that suddenly that API version gets retired by OpenAI company, then you won't be able to use that API, right? So use a stable API version. I'll just give the link of this documentation to you in the chat. Okay, although I've already mentioned my API version. Fine, now let's proceed ahead. Now, hopefully uh, access to resource has been granted. The authentication is successful and access to resource is granted. If access is granted, I'll just print a confirmation message to the user that access has been granted. OK, let's see if that is the case. I'll first try to clear the terminal and then run the coding file. OK, it says that access has been granted. Now let's proceed ahead. OK, uh, so first thing that I'll do is I'll mention the messages that I want to pass to my OpenAI model. So whatever messages that you are going to pass, it has to be passed as a list of dictionaries. OK, so if you guys remember, there were three type of messages that I introduced to you. One is the system message. Second is user message. Third is assistant message. OK. So let me pass those messages over here. The same messages that I passed without code. Now the same messages I'll pass it with code. OK, so let me show you how that works. So let me pass a system message. I'll say give the sentiment. Of the user's input. OK, so this was system message. Then the next type of message that I introduced you uh, to you guys was user message user message will act as example for your uh, sorry it will act as input for your example okay so this will act as input for your example on the other hand assistant message will act as output for your example so through your example you can communicate that okay if this is the input then you want this kind of output and so on fine so user message was another uh, message that i introduced to you guys okay uh, now uh, next message was assistant message, right? So let me explain to you about assistant message as well. OK, so as I mentioned, user message will act as input for your example. Assistant message will act as output for your example. OK, so let's do that. OK, so for this uh, input, you want the model to give this particular output and so on. Like this, you can go ahead and keep on adding examples. OK, you can go ahead, keep on adding examples. OK, so for what do you want for positive review? You want a score of plus one for negative review. You want a score of zero and for mixed review. Uh, you want us sorry for positive review. You want a score of plus one for negative review. You want a score of minus one. 
and for a mixed review, you want a score of zero. OK, fine. Let's see. Whether we are able to do that or not. For mixed review, we want a score of zero. OK, and at last, guys, whatever main input you want to give to the model. OK, we know using the without code approach, the main input is provided at this particular field. But how will you pass the main input using coding approach? Well, your main input is called user message. Now you might ask me uh, earlier also we have used user message, but remember guys that if the user message is immediately followed by assistant message, then it will be treated as an example. For the model, OK, it will be treated as an example for the model. Whereas if a user message is not immediately followed by assistant message, then it will be treated as the main input. That is to be provided to the model. OK, so let's suppose I want to ask the model that. This keyboard. Is bad. OK, so hopefully it should give me a uh, score of minus one as this is a negative review. Let's see. OK, by the way, I've mentioned my messages. Now I'll just go ahead and pass these messages to the model. So I'll tell my resource that now that I've gained access to you, please go ahead. Do chat completion and generate a response or create a response out of it. So first I'll mention the name of my deployed model. So the name of my deployed model is first model deployed, right? That's the name of it. First model deployed. I'll just copy that name and mention it over here. Then next I need to pass my messages. So let me go ahead and let me pass my messages. That I need to submit to the model. OK, I'll pass those messages and after passing those messages, uh, that's it probably. I'll just go ahead and ask the resource to create a response or generate a response. Let's save the response in a variable. After saving it, I'll print it to you guys. And a raw response will be printed. The raw response might not make sense to you at first. Don't worry, we will try to refine it. OK, currently there is an error. I guess the, there is a spelling mistake. It should be chat completions with a S at the end. Yes. I'll try to run the coding file again. Let's see the raw response and here is the raw response. And within the raw response, you can see your main output. Here is your main output. As expected for this particular input, I was expecting output of minus one and that's exactly what has happened over here. OK, now from this raw output, how you can get the thing that you want? How can you fetch this particular uh, thing that you want? Let me show you. So currently, uh, my main value that I want to fetch can be obtained by using this attribute called choices. OK, because the choices attribute has value from year to year. OK, so the value that I want can be fetched using this attribute called choices. Let me mention that. OK, let's see in that attribute now what do we have? OK, it is returning a list. Now let me get the first value of that list. This entire thing is the first value of the list uh, and you Python developers would know in order to get the first value of the list. We use index zero. Let me get it. OK, after that I am interested in this particular value in order to get that value. I can get it from this particular attribute called message. OK, so. Uh, that message attribute will have value from year to year. OK, fine. So in order to get the thing that I want, I can get it by using this attribute called message. So let me mention that. Let's see what do we get. OK, now the value that I want can be obtained by using this sub attribute over here called content. So let me go ahead and let me mention it. And I'll try to run the coding file. OK, and this is the output that you're getting. OK, similarly, let's suppose you pass something like. This keyboard was very good. It. Has good typing feel. OK, so there's a positive review in case of positive review. I want a score of plus one. 
let's see if the model does that or not. And you can see it does that. Okay, for positive review, it gives you a score of plus one. Like this, you can uh, uh, make sure to engineer the response of your model based on your prompt. So the thing that we just did over here was prompt engineering. Okay, we engineer the response of the model based on our prompt. Fine. So with this, we have seen a demo of open AI service as well. Okay, you guys up till now have the demos made, made sense to you. Let me open the chat. Guys, have the demos made sense? Everyone? Dharampal, Ravi, Siddiqui, Shalesh, everyone wish? Yes. Okay. Fine. So guys, that was our agenda for today. Okay. Our agenda was to cover these um, ready-made models that are available on Azure. Okay. I'll just open that agenda again. We had mentioned that agenda over here. Uh, where did it go? Mm -hmm. I had mentioned my agenda somewhere, right? Yes, over here. Okay, so we learned what is AI. We learned about, so we saw a demo of speech service. We saw a demo of vision service. After that, we saw a demo of document intelligence service, and then we also saw a demo of open AI service. So that was our main agenda for today. Uh, so if you have any doubts, you can ask me, or else we can stop the session over here. I hope uh, the session was informative for you. You learned something of value. Okay. Uh, for those who are preparing for uh, AI 102, uh, lecture. Um, if you want any dumps or anything, you can uh, contact me. I'll provide them to you. Okay. Fine. Uh, Siddiqui has a doubt. Siddiqui says, how are job opportunities? So Siddiqui, these are very basic certifications. Uh, expecting job just by getting this certification um, would not be right. Okay. So see, as a engineer, you're supposed to do multiple things. So fun. one is obviously using the models. OK, uh, second is um, deploying those models OK, for your client. So for that, you need to learn about ops, DevOps. OK, so if you know DevOps as well, if you know stuff like Docker and all of those things as well, then you become a full package and then your hiring chance will increase. But if you expect that, okay, you you will get hired just by uh, completing AI's 102 certification, just by getting that certification, then no, that won't happen. Okay, because nowadays the market is such that uh, companies look for all rounders. Okay, previously, many years back, uh, if you just knew how to uh, create these AI models, you were easily hired. Okay, but now teams want that. Okay, not only you will create the models, you will also handle the ops part. Okay, so if you know uh, DevOps stuff, uh, then you will become a full package and then uh, your hiring chance will increase. So I would say learn two things. First is learn how to make these models. Okay. Um, second is learn the ops part as well. Okay. So learn the DevOps part as well. So then, um, you can expect a very good salary. Okay, Dharampal says how to make OpenAI model. Uh, okay, so Dharampal, you uh, can use the OpenAI model, not make it. Currently, I'm using it, right? We are not making any OpenAI model. Now, you are saying how to make it uh, work with your database. Okay, so uh, can you put more light onto it? Like what type of data you have? What what is the scenario? What do you want to achieve? If you want, I can unmute you. Let me unmute you. I've unmuted you. Like you can. Yeah. So hi Smith. So yes. uh, yes. my question is like, let's say we are developing one application, right? Business applications. There we have the 
uh, their data users data is stored in the SQL database. And okay. Uh, okay. Uh, user can log into our application and he can user can see the their data based on their permission. Now, if you want to add this chat capability in our application, so user can type their question in the our chat window, which is provided inside the application. And this oh, internally, the open AI model can help us to phase the data from database for that user and he, we can res give the response. So oh, these models are okay. ge very generic, not relative to any applications context. But if we want to use this uh, uh, model capabilities in our application context, then how these, correct, correct. this will work here. Okay, so, okay. Let's see. so let's see. So let's suppose I have some data. Okay. Uh, let me take an example over here. So suppose, buddy, I have. Um, okay. Let let me take a scenario. Let's suppose I'm uh, operating a. Uh, what do you call these agencies? Huh? Travel agencies. So let's suppose I'm operating a travel agency and I have my brochures. Okay. And uh, what I want is I want. Uh, the OpenAI model to give me answers based on these brochures that I have with me. Let me uh, download these brochures first. I'll download these brochures and show it to you. Okay. So I'll make my OpenAI model fetch uh, response. I mean, uh, give give. I I'll make my OpenAI model give answer on my own data. Let me show you how to do that. I just go ahead unzip this folder. OK, and you can see, for example, uh, there's a New York brochure uh, here. You can see various recommendations are there. So let's suppose I ask my open AI model where to stay in New York. OK, by the way, let me remove all these examples and everything. OK, let me start from scratch. And now I will ask it where to stay in New York. So you will see what will happen is it will give me some random answer based on what it has trained. OK based on what it has trained. OK, you can see some random answer. But as per my brochure, I have suggested three places to stay, right? Manhattan Hotel, Grand Central Hotel, Park Hotel. So what if I want the model to give me a response based on my data? Where even that capability, um, I mean, that capability is given to you. You can pass your own data to the model. So let me show you. You can see there's an add your data option. You will just go ahead and add your data. I'll just click on add button over here. I'll select the data source. So I'll say that I'm going to upload files. OK, but internally those files, whatever you are passing will be uh, uploaded in a storage account resource. OK, um, as I mentioned, for those who are completely new to Azure, storage account is just like your Google Drive. Uh, just like in Google Drive, you can upload any type of files. Even in storage account, you can upload any type of files. OK. In simplistic terms, you can understand it in that manner. Okay, so here it's asking me to select a resource, an existing resource, or you can even create a new one. Let me create a new one. I'll go ahead and create a new one. Okay, I'll give a name to this resource. I'll call it um, adding. Data storage or yes. All right, then I'll select the region. Then my performance level is standard or premium. With standard tier, you will have lower latency, uh, but uh, the cost will be slightly high. Okay. Uh, sorry, my mistake. Uh, with premium tier, you will have more lower latency, but the cost will be slightly high. However, with standard tier, the latency will be slightly more. That means in order to perform read and write operations on the files that you are uploading in your storage account, the time taken will be slightly more. Okay, but uh, the main benefit of standard tier is that cost will also be low. Okay, so I'll select standard tier only just for lower cost. Redundancy, as I've explained, locally redundant storage. And now let me go ahead and let me create a resource of storage account service. So I'll just go ahead and create a resource of storage account service. All right. Now let's understand uh, Dharampal, what will happen over here. So Dharampal, I want to ask you a question. Dharampal, let's suppose I'll be uploading files, okay? So internally, what will happen Dharampal is, 
these files will be divided into chunks. OK, whatever data I'm passing, whatever data I'm passing, it will be divided into chunks. OK, small, small parts. Internally, it will be divided into small, small parts. Now I have a question for you, Dharampal. Dharampal, let's suppose I ask the model a question. OK, and the model is searching uh, for the answer in my data. Now, which approach will be ideal? That the model goes through all the chunks of data. Let's suppose we have 20 chunks of data. So your model goes through all the chunks of data uh, and then fetches the answer or the model goes to the relevant chunk of data and get the answer from it. Which approach will be more ideal for you? So, but uh, ideal will be the it should go to, to relevant chunk, but how Correct. it will identify which Correct. chunk are related? Yeah. Absolutely. Good question. Let's see solution of that also. But you are with me, right? That the ideal approach is that instead of uh, the model going through all the chunks of data, it only goes to the relevant chunk. Correct? Yeah, yeah, right. Okay. But, but your doubt is absolutely valid. How will the model know which chunk is relevant? Let's see that. Okay, fine. So what we'll do for this is uh, see uh, we'll implement a type of search because we want to find out which search is uh, which chunk is relevant. So we want to search which chunk is relevant. Now there are two type of searches that you can use. Okay, one is something called keyword search, which is like doing a normal control F. Okay, so just by doing normal control F, you can find out that okay you have mentioned some tokens in your question. Tokens, you can think of tokens as something called something as words or subwords. OK, so uh, for example, uh, OpenAI model would treat a word like Apple as one token. But a word like blueberries, it probably will divide it into two tokens. Blue would be one token and berries would be another token. OK, so tokens, you can think of it as words or subwords. OK, so whatever question you are passing, it will be divided. It will be broken down into words or subwords. So one way of finding out which chunk is relevant is you can do a normal control F that is known as keyword search. OK, that normal control F that you do is known as keyword search. OK, this said there is a second type of search which is called semantic search. So for example, if I go to Google.com and if I ask it, Give me revenue of Apple. And on the other hand, if I ask it. OK, and on the other hand, if I ask it to give me calories of Apple. It correctly understands over here that when I ask for revenue, I'm talking about Apple company. And when I ask about calories, I'm talking about Apple as a fruit. How does it know that? OK. So here what is happening is it is performing semantic search. OK, so one type of search was keyword search. It's like doing a normal control F that OK, you have some tokens in your question. Just see that those tokens are available in which chunk by doing a normal control F. On the other hand, the second type of search is called semantic search. OK, wherein what you do is you. Uh, assign context for each of the tokens. OK, you assign a context for each of the tokens. So your Google.com is understanding that your the word Apple that I'm talking about, the token Apple that I'm talking about, I'm talking about Apple as a company. Whereas on the other hand, in this page, when I'm talking about Apple, here I'm talking about Apple as a fruit. OK, so it is understanding the context. So Google employs something called semantic search, wherein what it does is for every token, it gives a array of scores or a vector of scores. OK, it gives an array of scores or a vector of scores. How it does it? That's a separate topic. But what it does is it uh, applies. Uh, it gives a score um, for every token. OK, so the idea is that tokens that are similar to one another will have similar array of scores. OK. So for different different fields, scores will be applied. So just to explain it in a very simple manner, it might happen that let's say you have a you are developing an array over here, and let's suppose here I'm talking about the token Apple. Okay, so it can assign scores that is it related to company based on that a value would be applied. 
then is it related to fruit based on that a value will be applied and so on okay so the point that i'm making is uh, for in semantic search for every token a score is assigned okay and the idea is that similar tokens will be assigned similar scores okay so now i was talking about two type of searches one is one is keyword search which is like doing a normal control f another is semantic search i won't go in much into depth of it because these searches itself are a very lengthy topic and it will take uh, more than one or two hours just to explain how the search works okay or how these scores are assigned uh, but without going into the depth just remember that there are two main type of searches that you can use keyword search and semantic search in keyword search it's like doing a normal control f whereas semantic search remembers the context behind every token okay and here in order to perform that search either keyword search or semantic search we will take help of search service okay we'll take help of search service so first i'll just make sure that whatever data i am uploading i will upload it to my storage account resource okay i will turn on cross resource communication so that my open ai resource uh, communicates with the storage account resource and then we know that the data internally will be divided into chunks ideally as dharampal mentioned we want a model to not go through all the chunks of data we want a model to only go into the relevant chunk so how will the model find which uh, which is the relevant chunk okay in order to do that it can employ two type of searches either keyword search or semantic search okay we'll go ahead and uh, use any one type of search over here but in order to perform that search i'll need help of this search service so i'll create a resource of it let me create a resource of search service over here and quickly i'll just create a resource let me create a resource of search service and after that i'll show you what next to do okay i'll choose the tier to basics just so that i have low cost okay and let me just go ahead and create a resource of search service okay so with this i will try to create a resource of search service over here okay so over here dharampal as you rightly mentioned what we want is uh, yes whatever data we are passing internally it will be broken down into chunks but we don't want our model to go through all the chunks of data we want our model to only go into the relevant chunk so how will the model know which is the relevant chunk which is not it will perform some search so there are two type of searches that you can perform either keyword search or semantic search and to perform that search i will take help of my resource of search service okay fine uh we also know that what search service does it organizes the data with the help of index so you can give a index name i'll call it test index okay let me upload the files so i'll just upload my data i'll say upload files and these data files we can upload via code also right in our application as soon as user upload any pdf file we can upload internally to the this service this model right correct correct so let's suppose you are saying that the files or new new files can come right yeah yeah right ah uh, so for that what to do let me go back and show that to you so if i just go back if i change my data source to azure blob storage okay you can say azure blob storage and now have a look can you see there is a option called scheduling the indexer that means what if in your blobs in your storage account whatever files you are uploading those files might change maybe new new files might come in so what you want is you want your open ai resource to update on that new data so you can schedule that update that okay uh, when to search for new data so will you uh, search for it hourly or daily or you don't want to search at all just once you want to get the data and be done with it okay so even that option is available to schedule that auto update so that the open ai resource updates its data okay so here that scheduling option is there 
okay keeping uh, the problem that you mentioned but okay. I, I won't and do that. Smith, one more question related to this. So in our application, let's say based on the different roles or access permission, user may have different type access of different type of documents. So here, mm -hmm. if we are keeping everything in one blob storage, let's say, so then how the access permission can get implemented in this uh, our chat? Sorry, sorry, can you repeat? So in the application, let's say different type of roles and permissions are implemented, right? In generally in all the applications, all users do not have access to all data. So like the you have the five, five files uploaded, right? So uh -huh. some user will have only access of one file. Some user will have access of two files and some user uh -huh. will have access of all five files. Uh -huh. OK. OK, so in that scenario, what you will have to do over here is you will have to create different deployments for different type of users. OK, okay. Mm -hmm. because uh, this one deployment that I have made over here, uh, in that you cannot segregate that. OK, um, the user can one user can only access this file, other user can only access that file. What you can do is you can create different deployments in one deployment, provide five files. So the uh, users input will uh, scan those five files on the other end in the second deployment provide one file and so on so for different type of roles you can create different deployments okay, okay. and that you can do okay yeah. but within the deployment you cannot do any more segregation but huh, you can create new new deployments okay based on the roles okay let's proceed let me upload the files i have done that uh, it's asking me to do a uh, select the type of search. As I mentioned, the data will be broken down into chunks, either keyword search or semantic search. Uh, sorry, the data will be broken down into chunks uh, and you want your model to not go through all the chunks of data. You want your model to only go into the relevant chunk, right? Uh, so uh, what you would do is you will uh, try to search which is the relevant chunk. Either you can use keyword search or semantic search for that. OK, so as I mentioned, semantic search is more better Then you can mention the chunk size that what will be the size of each chunk. Uh, whatever size you are mentioning will be in terms of tokens. OK, so as I mentioned, tokens can be thought of as words or subwords. So you can select the size. I'll keep it default. OK, authentication will be key based authentication. And that's it. I will upload my data. OK, so this is known as RAG, Retrieval Augmented Generation, wherein you are retrieving the relevant chunk of data. And after retrieving the relevant chunk of data, you are generating the response. OK, so this is Retrieval Augmented Generation, RAG, R-A-G. OK, wherein you are retrieving the relevant chunk of data and based on that, you are generating the response. OK, so let's see. Currently, the data ingestion is in progress. It should be over within a few seconds. And then I will show to you whether it's actually working or not. Okay, it is over. Now, guys, in my data that I uploaded, if you see this New York brochure, what are the hotels that I've recommended? Manhattan Hotel, Grand Central Hotel, Park Hotel, right? So now, if I ask my model to, uh, if I ask it where to stay in New York, as per my data, Three hotels are recommended, right? Manhattan Hotel, Grand Central Hotel, Park Hotel. So my model should give me the exact same information. It should say Manhattan Hotel, Grand Central Hotel, Park Hotel. OK, and you can see it does that over here. So what we have done, we have passed our own data to the model, and the model is giving me the response based on my own data. OK, so you can employ this if you want to. OK, so yeah. Dharamphal. Thank you. Yes, OK, and yeah. yes, welcome. All right. Uh, Ravi says, can you please explain how to fine tune the base model as for my requirement of a use case where I input a text example of self description and need to generate keywords from it? That is extracting skill sets. OK, basically I need to build a model and train it with my historical data so that I get desirable keyword output. OK, so you want uh, to 
generate keywords okay all right mm, i'm just thinking what would be the right approach for it extracting keywords like can you give me an example like uh, as you mentioned if you input a text so like for example tags is that what you want to generate tags or uh, or, or do you want to generate something like uh, these entity entity recognition is that what you are saying that from the text text it uh, gets the important entities like location entities and all of those is that what you are mentioning entity recognition extracting entities or something else because if you want to do entity recognition there is already a model in the language service which does that for you okay but if you want to train it on your own uh, then you will have to do it like this buddy uh, uh, and, and since you have mentioned gpt uh, you will have to do it uh, by using the system messages field user message field assistant message field okay uh, it's just that in your scenario you will have to pass uh, more uh, more examples okay for your use case uh, although uh, see uh, when we pass these examples it's not like gpt model is getting trained okay it's just that we are customizing the output of the model based on a prompt so we are just doing prompt engineering we are not training the model okay so gpt model we are not training it okay all we are doing is engineering the response of the model based on a prompt but in your case uh, to implement it with a gpt model one approach you can do with this system message field as user message field assistant message field mm. uh, although if i uh, have more idea about your use case maybe i'll be able to communicate the solution better okay but with gpt model i mean as i mentioned you are not training the model even here in rag rag we are not training the model it's just that the model is searching for uh, the relevant chunk and from that chunk it is just getting the information and showing it to us so the model is not getting retrained okay so you cannot retrain a gpt model you can do prompt engineering on it. You can employ rag on it, retrieval augmented generation, just like we did. But uh, I cannot train a already trained a GPT model. Okay. Uh, De Deepak mentions, is there a link to documentation for Azure OpenAI Studio? Uh, yes. So all you have to do is just search for the service name and just mention this term documentation in front of it like this you will be able to get the documentation of any service let's say speech service or let's say language service okay like this you can get the documentation of any service so let me just take the link and paste it in the chat Okay, Ravi says input is I'm an architect having experience on .NET. Okay, so you are uh, extracting entities out of it. In this scenario, uh, .NET is let's say a language entity. Okay, you can try a language service, buddy. Uh, there is already uh, uh, pre-trained models available that can that you can use also in the language service there will be option to uh, train your uh, uh, ask azure to create a customized model for you so the uh, as per the requirement what you have just mentioned i guess language service will be one that you should use okay uh, even better than open ai i guess language service will be uh, more better for you okay so uh, try it um, and if you face any doubts, you can always contact me on LinkedIn. Okay. Fine. All right. So that's it for today's class, guys. Thank you so much for attending. I hope you found uh, the training valuable. You learned something of value. Okay. Uh, you can always connect um, with me on LinkedIn. You can also uh, connect um, with my 
companies uh, social media links uh, so you can connect with synergetics um, social media accounts okay and uh, you can ask doubts over there if you want to ask doubts to me personally you can contact me on my linkedin as well okay yes thank you dharampal okay so thank you so much everybody for attending again have a great day everyone and bye guys bye everyone